Welcome to the Short Term Show, the show about short term rentals and long term wealth, with real property owners hosting real properties who are crushing it in the vacation and short term rental space. And here's your host, Avery Carl. This episode of The Short Term Show is brought to you by The Short Term Shop. If you're interested in buying a short-term rental in one of the top vacation markets in America, just go to theshorttermshop.com and click Get Connected with an Agent. If you purchase a home with the shop, you'll have access to all of our client-only benefits, such as training on how to manage your short-term rental. So we'll teach you everything you need to know from how to set up your Airbnb and Verbo listings to how to use the property management software that you'll need to streamline your business, all the way down to helping you source your local boots on the ground like cleaners, handy people, et cetera. We've taught thousands of people just like you how to buy and manage their vacation homes from anywhere in the world. So head on over to the shorttermshop.com and click get connected with an agent to get started. I do have to mention that we're brokered by EXP or else I get in trouble. We'll see you guys over there. Hey guys, welcome back to the short term show. Today, I was actually very surprised our guest showed up in an Iron Maiden shirt. I think this is the first person we've ever had on the show that is more metal than me, or at least that I'll admit anyway. And uh, his name is Marcus Rader. He is from Hostaway, which a lot of you are going to be familiar with, but really, really excited to get this interview started. We may throw in some metal talk. Sorry about that to those of you who are not fans. But when I meet my metal brethren in the real estate world, uh, it makes me happy. So how's it going, Marcus? Oh, things are going just uh, just great. Uh, we have so many exciting things going on at, at Hostaway, and it's uh, it's a sunny day today like it's been for the last six weeks <laughs> the, the sun is shining it's uh things are overall really good thank you so much for having me here yeah yeah thanks for coming on so let's just start at the beginning tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the vacation rental space yes so i um I have lived in in a lot of different places, and uh, but but pretty early on when I, I was at university, I started business. I, I realized I want to be in, in something technology related, and um, so I've been in a bunch of different technology companies. And and the one uniting factor there was always the word startup. That was always what what I really enjoyed, the idea of having a, a company that probably is going to fail. And when you look at a hundred other companies that tried the same thing, they all failed. But then every once in a while, someone succeeds at making it successful. And when they do, because it's technology, it can be leveraged and you can become even the biggest company in the world one day. That, I found that incredibly fascinating. And, and the type of people who are drawn to those kind of jobs are, are very different from most of the other people. When you walk down the street, you wouldn't see, most of the people you see wouldn't be like that. Um, and... Um, Back in 2015, uh, me and my, my wife were living in Finland and she got for the second time an offer to just move over to Canada. And we thought that's exciting because we travel a lot, but we've never been to Canada. So we decided let's move to Canada. And that turned out to be really, really cool um, because Canada is close to Florida, which is also really cool. Um, now, when, when we got in as newly landed immigrants, it's... Um, it's hard. Um, I, I'd say moving within Europe is a bit like moving within from one state to another. You, you keep, you know, some sense of familiarity or fairly close to friends or relatives. Being on a new continent is, is a completely different game. And um, I only did one job interview and it would have probably been a good job, but I failed it because there was an uh, IQ test, I think, uh, and all the measurements there were, were imperial. And I didn't know what they are. And uh, so I failed the IQ test. And that's when I thought, well, maybe actually I should now use all the knowledge that I've gathered about startups, especially the failing ones, and just learn from that and build my own company. And that's exactly what I ended up doing. And, um, and pretty soon, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by real estate, just like, just like you. And um, pretty soon I, I found out that there's, there's a massive opportunity in the, in the Airbnb space. And it's, it's way bigger and way more professional than I realized before. And uh, that's what we started building on. And coming in as a, a newcomer to a completely new industry was, uh, was very, 
interesting. But on the other hand, I've done that at every other company where I worked at. Actually, many of the positions that I've held in the past is where I leveraged the assets of the company to go into a new market or a new industry. So I, I become very good over the years at learning new things and figuring out the who's who's and the what's what's in, in any space. And well, since since then, over the last seven years, we're now one of the, the leading PMS providers in for vacation rentals worldwide. We're one of the biggest ones. And it's um, it's it's been a, an amazing journey. Yeah, that is an amazing journey. Man, failing an IQ test, that's not, it seems unfair because it wasn't in the right measurements, but it seems like that worked out well for you. Very well, yes, yes. <laughs> All right, so let's let's talk about HostAway for a minute. So I think pretty much everybody who's listening to this show is going to be pretty familiar with what a PMS is, property management software. So guys, for those of you who aren't familiar, if you're just now tuning in, uh, it's a piece of software or platform that uh, helps connect all of your different listings and booking sites into one dashboard and helps you automate a lot of different processes within your management of your properties. But let's talk about that for a minute. So it kind of seems like every single property management software has one thing that they do really, really well. What would you say is the biggest strength of HostAway? That's an easy one. It's our customer support. It's um, it's one of our key aspects, and it's it's something that I can. I, I've I listen to how a lot of companies answer this question, and sometimes they give vague answers. They say, "Oh, it's our our culture," or or uh, well, they don't say any more pricing. That could be it, but that's yeah, usually you, you get what you pay for in in every industry, and the same goes for software, of course. Um, but uh, but the reason why we're able to build support uh, so well is that we when we we are designing the software itself, we keep that in mind. We make sure that it's easy to use. We we always we sometimes have to change the way uh, we design our functionality because it would be impossible to support. So that's something that's always front for us is how are we able to support the customers using that? One of our values is uh, our customer success is our success. So if we build a good piece of software that nobody can use and nobody can support, then then we're not gonna do it that way. So that's the one differentiator is our support. That is very key because who hasn't run into a situation with any piece of software where you're like, oh my God, it's not doing, I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to get around this thing. I need to call somebody and have them tell me, like walk me through how to get over this hump. So that's definitely a very, very valuable um, strength to have. Um, so let's talk about integrations really quick. Uh, tell me about what other platforms such as, you know, pricing tools, other things like that, uh, what integrations does HostAway offer? Uh, good question. We actually have uh, have what I've seen. We have the biggest marketplace in the industry. We have over 120 companies that are integrated to us. So, for example, Dynamic Pricing Tools. We got the three, four big ones, but we got I think a total of seven. And if you want someone to build a website, if you want a different solution for managing smart locks, for managing cleaners. Um, pretty much anything you want, it's available on our marketplace. And we've grown that um, to, to a place where new companies that are launching product in the space, they know that they can come and talk to us. And one reason why that is, is that we, we don't charge anything for it. So we partner with good solutions that offer good value to our customers. Uh, but unlike our competition, we don't charge money for it, which may seem a bit short-sighted, uh, but it's actually once again aligned with our value. Our customer success is our success because we want to provide the best tools and we don't want any barriers there. And we also don't want to be, you know, putting our hands in someone else's pocket. If we recommend a dynamic pricing tool to our, our user, then they should be paying them directly. But there shouldn't be any deal where we go back and we take back money from that. I, I don't like that that model too much at all. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I feel the same way. So on my side of the business with affiliate codes and, you know, if, if I'm referring our clients to another business, I want to be referring them because I believe in that business. And I know that business is going to take good care of them, not because I'm going to get some kind of a kickback for that. And I feel the same way about people referring people to us. Um, I, I want to be referred to because 
they believe in us and know we'll take good care of their clients rather than because we're going to pay them money for it. So I, I 1000% agree with that, uh, with that idea that, you know, you refer based on the ability to take care of someone and not because we're, we're trading money all, all over the place. I totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and what we had in have instead is we we have a have a mutual agreement. We got we're we're quite number driven, so we we measure uh, we measure, for example, how many shared customers we have. But then we also measure how many times did we mention that partner in our sales conversations, and we can share those metrics with our partners. And then we just expect the same thing in return. And uh, so if we if we include you in a newsletter, you'll include us in a newsletter. And and we do that very systematically. And so far, it's working out very well. So so the way it's working is that we can refer customers to our partners, and we know they'll be taken care of. And and likewise, the partners that recommend us, we give them the VIP treatment. Totally agree. I think that's such a great a great way of doing business. So while we're on the on the topic of money and pricing, so what is the what's the cost for maybe a new owner or host to to get host away? So um, there's there's a minimum account fee of a uh, hundred dollars a month. So for someone who's uh, who's small, maybe has one or two properties, uh, that's a that's a decision that you have to make if you're you're willing to invest that. Uh, for most of the the people, that's usually not a not a problem um, in in high end markets because the cost that you'll be Dealing with and the time you'll be spending with a with a lower cost solution wouldn't be be too great. Uh, then when it comes to to bigger property managers or let's say the mid size, let's say twenty to one hundred properties, um, it, it will be tailored based on your needs. So it's a it's a customized quote and um, and but I would say overall it's quite competitive. Uh, our pricing so that's that's the feedback that I got from our from our customers um, when it comes to enterprise solutions we have an entirely different different set there where we be a lot of the functionality that we today offer has been developed uh, together with our enterprise clients so our biggest customer has 8,000 properties wow. um, and um, and uh, I can't name exactly which features they they had influence on um, but we have several several clients in that uh, in that size range, and so if you're out there with thousands of properties, and and our system is perfect except this one little thing, I'm pretty sure we can reach an agreement on that. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the content of our podcast, but you have additional short-term rental questions, we host a weekly live question session that you guys can join for free. It's at 1 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays. And if you head over to strquestions.com, you can sign up. So not only am I the host of this show, but I also own and manage my own properties. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about short-term rental investing. So please join us anytime for a free weekly live Q&A on Zoom. Sign up at strquestions.com. So that's, I think that's a really good, a, a really attractive quality in a, a property management software is being able to, you know, start with one and scale up infinitely. Because when you're starting, you don't ever really know, okay, am I going to end up with 10 short-term rentals or am I going to really, really, you know, make this a, a management business and end up with a hundred, a thousand, something like that. So to be able to not have to switch platforms mid growth is really attractive because that's a huge pain, huge time suck. It's very tedious to have to switch any kind of platform in business, but um, that, that's cool that you're able to scale that way. Yeah, and actually one one advantage that we have that uh, there's some bigger, uh, bigger, let's say groups of companies that are consolidating right now. And, um, and they have the challenge that if they have a solution for smaller clients and the client grows, they need to basically switch them over to another solution within the same group. And I'm sure they have well integrated tools to do that migration but you still have to change systems. The way we built the platform instead, we don't have three different platforms. We have just one, but the way you operate it is different. So let's say once you, if you start with us with three properties, you, you use it in a certain way, but once you hit 10 or 20, we're going to reach out to you and say, hey, I noticed that the way you're using it today is probably not the more efficient. If you turn it around and use it this way instead, it's going to work a lot better now that you've grown. And that's that's one reason why customers stay with us as they grow 
because they're able to stay on the same platform. They're just going to change a bit their their operations or the way they do their daily work, maybe the way they delegate because they're a bigger team and our system supports that. So you don't need to migrate to a separate system. That's really, really convenient for, for hosts and owners like at any stage of their career. So that's awesome. Um, so let's talk a minute for a minute about direct booking. So do you guys plug into any independent website or do you guys have like your own template for direct booking outside of the big OTAs, which for anybody who's just tuning in, OTAs are going to be your Airbnb, Verbo, stuff like that. So do you guys provide a template or do you plug in with independent websites or both? We, we do both. Uh, so, so we can integrate with pretty much any existing website. We also, on our marketplace, we have, um, we have partners such as uh, ICMD and Boostly who can build a website for you. But we offer our own uh, website builder, which is almost fully customizable. And we got a couple of really cool features there. It's First of all, it's connected to our coupons so you can generate even on the fly you can generate a coupon for just one client or you can do the first 10 people who book with these parameters get this discount and that can be used on the on the website um, another cool feature that we have is you can upsell functionality right on the website so if you want want to there even at the booking process you want to charge separately for parking or maybe you charge separately for early check-in or late checkout you can do that before the people book which is a much better guest experience because you don't want to book a place and then later find out that things you might assume were available you have to pay extra for them but if you know it up front you might even click it right there and for a property manager a lot of that revenue goes directly in their pocket, which is an added benefit because it, it boosts the bottom line, which is quite thin sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and as an extra extra bonus, what's, what we're releasing soon is the ability to have multiple booking engines. So many of our customers there, in order to have a good vacation rental website, usually the keywords you need for that are based on one area. But as you grow, you're going to be in multiple areas. So what you ideally want is multiple websites with different domain names. And um, we're going to be supporting that soon so that our, our multi-city and even multi-country uh, customers can have as many booking engines and websites as they want. Do you get many multi-country hosts and, and owners? That's really interesting. Well, I guess in Europe, you probably do. Yeah, and not only in, in Europe, it's quite common. Uh, for example, Canada is, uh, is a fairly big market for us, but it's, it's quite common that the bigger companies, they also operate in, in, uh, in the US and uh, Mexico, Caribbean. And, and same thing for US property managers, they, they go across states. And what you often find is that they need separate management team and we have all the user management there. But then they have different taxes, different regulations, so many trust accounting in some states. Um, so yeah, there's, there's really, I, I would say in the segment of less than 20 properties, it's quite rare, but, but we have a substantial user group that are bigger than that. And for them, it's quite, it's quite natural that when you get offered a, a project that's outside of, of your original area that you, you evaluate it, you evaluate it. And quite often, if you have the tools available, you can take that opportunity. So a, a good example is uh, we, we had a client who was, who was really big in, in the Montreal market. And uh, Montreal didn't do well during COVID and, and then it was quite regulated, but during COVID as, as travel, there was almost no travel to Montreal at all. They were offered a hotel that they were able to convert into apartments by building kitchens into them um, in Mexico. And that hotel today is bigger than their entire operations before in Montreal. Oh, that's awesome. I, I think that COVID did provide a, a forced pivot for a lot of people that did end up actually being a good thing. Not that COVID was a good thing. Don't y'all don't go say Avery said COVID was a good thing, but it did force some pivots that made people do new things or try new things in their businesses that overall ended up being good for their businesses. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and it had uh, it had a lasting impact on the on the consumer behavior. I always look when I look at data, I always look at the big underlying causes of any trends. So, um, so for example, there's going to be there there was a percentage of all travelers that tried something new during COVID, whether it's renting in a new location, renting with different people. For example, we we started renting cottages with our with our friends 
and sharing it, which is something we haven't done before. Uh, previously, we rented a place and then invited friends to visit, but now we just rented it together because we could get a bigger place. Uh, that's just one example. And of course, remote work, but a lot of things changed there and not everyone is going to go back. Someone who tried something new that they haven't done before, like working remotely for one month, part of those are going to keep doing it. So there yeah. isn't any any return to normal anymore. No, there's, there's some people tried something new and many of those will continue doing this new thing. And that, that's, uh, that's a great shift that we've seen that has benefited the short-term rental industry a lot. Yeah, yeah, it, it really has. And so let's talk about, it's a nice segue into reporting. Uh, so a big pain point that I've had with other, um, other platforms is not being able to see how much money I'm making very quickly. Like it can be very clunky. I can't just push a button and say, oh yeah, this property has done this much this year. This property has done this much. It's, it's a lot more involved than that. It takes a lot longer. And so I don't look at it as much as I would have liked um, back then. So uh, what, tell me about the reporting that you guys offer on your platform and what that looks like. Wow, that's a that's a great uh, great question uh, because we we spent four years developing that before we even released it, and it's um, the the main reason is that the, so first of all, that's how much money is a property making? That that sounds like a simple question, but it's very multi dimensional. Uh, first of all, it's making money from different sources. You have you might be renting it out on Airbnb and Verbo and different OTAs. You might be renting it out on, on your own website. And each of those sources have a different way of reporting that money. For example, taxes, um, daily rates, extra person fees. Um, then each property you have an arrangement or you have expenses with the owners. Maybe one is on a revenue share, a different one is on a revenue share, but uh, you do something different with the cleaner cleaning fee. But then to add more complexity to that, every property manager has one or even many different business models. Some of them do rental arbitrage, some of them do a revenue share. And even those who do revenue share, basically, I haven't seen anyone using any standardized formula. Just Google it, it doesn't exist. There's no standardized formula. And, and a lot of property managers end up with different formulas for different owners. The owner says, oh, I don't want it like this. And then you change the contract. So we built a completely customizable system. But the reason it took so long was that the data that was coming in, it's also different. So if you got 21 properties in, in Montana on Airbnb, and you look at the data from there, and then you add a property in Wyoming, you might suddenly find that the exact same data doesn't work anymore for that one property in Wyoming because it's reported differently over there, even though it's from Airbnb. Um, so we were able to consolidate all of this and you can create custom formulas. And what makes it really powerful is you can then put formulas within formulas. So you can, for example, add up income from Airbnb and income from Verbo and income from the website and then just to give an example, maybe you tell your owners, hey, when it comes to our website, we're adding, we're taking 15% of that, just like Airbnb is. And suddenly you're making 15% more. And you can put it all in a formula and and it it works. And then if you don't believe that, you could just download a reservation breakdown. So you see for each reservation, every line item. And that's what we use as our foundation for the the owner statements that are are shared automatically with the with the owners. So that's, uh, that's something that's really powerful and it's very, very easy to set up. That's the, that's the key because we consolidate all these data fields in our system. Yeah, easy to set up is key, I think, for end users, right? <laughs> Nobody wants complicated. Yeah, sorry, I got a bit carried away. I'm just so excited oh. about the product. And, <laughs> and these days, uh, because we're so big, I don't get to work with the product. And, and very few people ask me about the product because we got you know, the sales team, they can sell and the products can product. I, I rarely get asked about the product these days. So it's really, I'm really excited. Oh, well, good, good. Well, this is going to be a, maybe a little bit of a weird and hard to answer question. So you have the unique position of being able to see a lot of different properties performances in a lot of different types of markets. So 
Is there a specific type of market that seems to perform better than other types of markets? So by type of market, I mean like metro downtown markets or like national park or beach or mountain or even specific states that do better. That might be way too pointed of a question, but no, no not at all. We actually do do a lot of this work uh, because because for us. Well, COVID was one one example. We found out that working with customers who are operating in in non-attractive or risky markets is not really good for our business. So we we actually do this on a regular basis, and and sometimes when we find interesting insights, we we share it with um, with the media. So just last week, I was in Forbes talking about the trends for for holiday bookings, and. So, so right now, I'd say overall, uh, the the segment that is doing really well and will keep doing well is is luxury, because there is a there's a lot of worries in the economy. I think Walmart uh, in their in their last quarterly report had a that they said that revenues are going up, and that's because uh, Walmart is a low cost um provider overall so it means that people who cannot afford more expensive options they will go to walmart but at the same time losses are coming because people are stealing things and that's the the economic reality that we or they're stealing more than before so so their profits didn't go up as much as the revenue would have uh, substantiated and um and that's an example of how the the economy changes things on the consumer side and that's where we're seeing that that a lot of the effects on on the economy that are going on right now, for example, inflation, they're not really hitting the the target audience of lux- those who would rent luxury properties, and that's that's global. Uh, we can see that that in uh, in the winter destinations in the U.S. Uh, I'm not sure if you noticed, but the entire Florida is rented out for this winter season already. <laughs> Um, but if you want to rent an RV, you can still do it. But if you want to rent a, a big house, there they don't exist anymore. So that's that's one trend that we're seeing. Um, another thing that's that's really clear from the data is, and and well, it's actually not clear from the data because there is there's no data on that. But basically, people want places to work. And I think uh, a good example of this is, is when you do a search in an area on Airbnb and they, they highlight those properties that they think you're most likely to book, the front image that used to be the swimming pool, now suddenly they show you a, a good view of the living room with a working area. So they show you an actual desk. And, and that, that's exactly it. People want to work remotely. And what's required to work remotely is not only a desk, you, you need good internet. So you see things like uh, good internet in the descriptions and or, or reliable internet or fast Wi-Fi. These are keywords that weren't really around before, but the way we can see it in the data is that it's bigger places. You want multiple rooms uh, because if you rent a studio and you're there even as a couple and both are working remotely, you can't do it because you need to be in different rooms um, and, and you want many different flexible spaces like outdoor spaces to sit and um yeah that those are two segments where we're seeing seeing really strong demand right now interesting and not all that surprising either (laughs) well i I don't know in in seven years there's often been these moments where where we go out and we say something then we look at the data and then it shows the opposite and then we start digging around and and media saying one thing and then the data says another and then it takes a while when you find a new trend it takes a while for it to shift Mm -hmm. because because the data sometimes comes in hindsight so you need to trust your gut instinct and then combine that with the data but it's uh yeah right now i agree yeah it's not it's not that surprising uh but uh but it is interesting Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so i'm going to switch gears really quick because you have a lot of experience with vc funding and startups and all of that fun stuff which i think a lot of people find that really interesting so i definitely wanted to pick your brain about that so i guess my first question on that is can you just kind of take us through like what the startup journey looks like absolutely so uh there's there's one I've had in the in the this year I've actually had enough time to connect to a couple of what I would call extremely good 
founders or extremely successful people. So not not the millionaires, but the billionaires of of the world. And um, if there's one thing I can learn from their startup journey that's very different from my startup journey is that it really helps if you're really, really rich when you start out. <laughs> if you just have that 10 million sitting on a bank account and then you start a company, that can really help you go a long way. <laughs> um, so that's that's one lesson that I, I can share here so that you don't need to spend seven years like me to actually get to talk to the people who know stuff. Um, but for us, this this was, we didn't have any money at all. I mean, it's not like, we only had 5 million, like the founders of Stripe. <laughs> um, we quite literally had zero. And uh, and to start from that is the journey that, of course, most startups go through. And um, it's quite tough getting, getting started because startups have basically three ways of funding themselves. Um, one is that you do something similar on that's related to it. A good example here would be you run a property management company and then on the side, you start a technology company and then you fund the, with the profits or the salary you're getting for your main business, you fund the other business, which is not optimal because then you can't focus 100% on a new business. Um, another way to finance it is by working on the side, uh, which is once again, not optimal. You can't focus on that. Actually, there's four ways. The, mm -hmm. the third way is to have your own money, which is the easiest option. That's why I said next time I just, I start a company, I'm going to make sure I'm rich first. <laughs> um, and then the fourth way is to, to seek outside funding. And that's what, uh, what a lot of companies are, are forced to do. But of course, seeking funding isn't it's something that's often glorified and, and people dream about it. And they say, oh, one day I'm going to raise 10 million or I'm going to raise 100 million and I'm going to change the world. But it's that's an image put out by big capital. The very people who, who want to invest this money into companies, they want people to want that investment. A bit like uh, Hollywood wants to sell us on the idea that everyone should be young and beautiful and uh, and fast and furious, and um, and the same same idea is being sold by by investors because they want people to be young and hungry and desperate and go and raise a hundred million and then turn it into um, like Airbnb fifty seven billion. That's the investor's dream. So what a, what a my attitude has changed a lot over the last seven years. I used to dream about that. And we, I think our biggest round was only 1 million. And we haven't raised any capital in, in over three years, four years. Yeah, four years, which I'm very happy that we haven't. But, um, and, and there's time and a place to raise capital. But desperation is probably the worst, worst reason to go out and raise capital. And that's what most founders will find themselves in a place of desperation unless they have a side job and can't focus on the job or they have a huge amount of savings from before. Um, yeah, that's that's my opinion about funding in, in general. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not easy at all. It's, it's just because you have a good idea and a good business, you can't just go out and raise money either. I mean, you can, but you're going to have 200 people saying no or even worse, they're going to laugh at you. That's, uh, that's usually how a funding round goes. And then one person is going to say yes, and suddenly you have 10 others who say yes, and then you're going to make <laughs> it happen. Well, yeah, that's my next question. So how do you even find the 200 people to laugh at you and tell you no? How do you know where those people are to even ask? That's really, really... I wish I could say that's easy, but no, that's, <laughs> that's really, really hard. Well, first of all, you're going to need a lot of practice. So when you're starting a company, I think raising funding should be treated no separately than any other aspect. Because as you're starting out with a company, you need to sell everyone on the idea. You need to sell your parents on the idea because they're going to be judgmental. You know, if you if you spend five years of your life in a basement and then you go out to them and say, here's the fact, I'm unemployed. I don't have any money. They're going to you know, you, you want to you hedge your bets. You don't want them to come and say, shouldn't you get a job? Um, but then you need, to, you need to do the same thing with your friends, with, your fa with all your family, because you're going to need them. They need to be supportive there. When you're failing and when you're succeeding, you need them 
right around you. So you need to be very vocal about selling this idea to them. And the main reason you want to do that is you want the feedback because you need to sell the idea to yourself because you're going to wake up pretty much every day uh, with low self-confidence and you need to motivate yourself and convince yourself that this is really going to happen. Um, okay, so you're selling this to yourself and to your family and to your parents. Then you need to start selling it to customers. And then once you can afford to hire people, you need to sell them on the idea that they should not take this comfortable, reliable job that pays well. Instead, they should just trust you, which is <laughs> probably what they won't do. But they'll pretend to trust you if you're good enough. So you're already in this mood that you're selling this impossible dream to everyone, and especially yourself. Um, so after that, the pitching itself, you just go out, just just make it a lifestyle. Everyone you meet everywhere, you're just pitching it. You're pitching the dream. You're saying, look, I'm a successful founder. I have this company. Um, and, and you'll inevitably run into people who say, hey, my friend, he's, he's actually working for a VC that not invest in these type of companies. Maybe I could introduce you. And if you have enough pitching experience, especially if you stand in, in front of a mirror every morning as you wake up and you pitch yourself the idea of the dream, it's going to be fairly easy to run through the pitch with, uh, with any investors as well. Okay. But finding them is not, not going to be easy. But, well, you, you, you can reach out to them on LinkedIn or, or the website. But if you haven't been pitching this to, to yourself or to your family, then you're not going to be able to have a successful pitch to VCs either. So you're saying you kind of have to work through your own network and hope somebody knows somebody who knows somebody. There's not just like a list that you can download somewhere of, oh, these are the VC funds and the exact contact information that you need to go find these people to pitch to. It's it's very similar to the music industry where there's a lot of people who, who play an instrument and you can play in your basement or your bedroom, uh, but to actually get a record label, if you haven't done the legwork, if you haven't even gone out into the living room and played the instrument to your own family, it's going to be almost impossible for you to get across the street to the local bar and say, hey, can I come on Friday night and play for free? But if you've done that, you can take it one step further. You can go to the, to the music hall down the road and you can say, can I play here? And then move on bigger and bigger. And of course, you can you can reach out to record labels and you can reach out to VCs to get that investment. But if you've never even taken one footstep outside your own bedroom, they're going to see that right away and they won't even give you a reply. But once you have, once they, you know, you get to play in a music hall, um, then they're going to be there and they're going to listen. Same thing with VCs. Go to, go to startup events, go to uh, pitching competitions. They're, they're going to be looking at that. But you need wow. to take the first steps, baby steps. That's a really, really good analogy that I had never thought about before, but you're exactly right. It's exactly the same. That was great. My mind's blown now. <laughs> All right. So let's get back to, um, to short-term rentals because we're running out of time here. And I do have a, a really important question for you. So you've got a lot of experience in this. You, you've seen the performance of a lot of different hosts, a lot of different owners, a lot of different property management companies from you know, people who own one property to 8,000, like you said. So what do you think, where do you think the vacation rental industry is headed? What do you think our future looks like? So our future looks a lot more professional. Uh, things are going to get more standardized. And there's, it's been a wild west for the last 10 years. And I think um, Airbnb is, is, one of the main reasons why we're on this show today, but also one of the main reasons why this whole industry has been uh, been going through so many changes is that they they entered, they created their own market outside of the traditional vacation rental areas, and then eventually it had to merge. Now, when I say Wild West, it means that pretty much everyone could do anything they wanted. And in the good times, everyone may money but in the bad times you well when the tide goes goes out you see who's naked and right. uh, that's exactly what has happened multiple times over the last seven years that i've been here and um that's gonna change we're gonna we're gonna see that there's going to be less drastic movements and less drastic trends and rather this industry will become more standardized. So for example, the guest expectations, they will be 
they will have to be met. You won't be able to compete with properties that lack basic amenities that are not in good shape. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about cleaning fees. Those are going to be standardized. The hotel industry went through the same when they had resort fees and there was a lot of discussion because someone was charging $5 a day and another hotel was charging $100 a day and then it became standardized. So um, this is what we're gonna see. And the way to get there is, is through technology. Um, not only the technology that we sell, but for example, Airbnb and, and Verbo uh, are making a lot of updates to the, to the guest journey, to the way it works, to the way you book a place, you find a place, to the way you interact with the, with the owner or the property manager. All of that is getting standardized, and that's really good to see because it means that you will actually be able to stand out better if you're if you're doing the right things. If you're a good business person and you're making good decisions, you will be able to accelerate your business. And at the same time, if you're if you're cutting corners, uh, breaking laws, um, you you will be you will be gone in five years. It's that simple. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that, that that's really interesting insight. And I do think that the years of the corner cutters are are gone. There was a host or owner in one of the markets that I started in that he was kind of like the slumlord of the market. He owned probably like 30 places and he was one of the first ones to, to do it, but all of his places were falling down. They had terrible like mauve colored carpet or green uh, as he started to sell them all off, I actually went through all of them because I was an agent in that market and, and got to see, but um, it was like, he had these really crappy properties that he bought for basically nothing, never put any work into any of them. And he was making money because he was able to just, you know, rent things for 50 bucks a night. But as that market has matured and more sophisticated hosts have come in, he sold everything off because that model just didn't work anymore. That's right. You, you can't just throw the same IKEA furniture that 100,000 other places have and then rent out the place for six people. And when they sit down for dinner, there's only five forks available. <laughs> that, that doesn't work anymore. And that was a great business model back in 2015 or even in 2019. It worked just fine. But then in 2020, a lot of these companies uh, buckled under. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Marcus, it has been so fun having you on. We're coming to the end of the show. Uh, so I have three questions that I ask every single person towards the end of the show. The first one is, what advice would you give 20-year-old Marcus? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, in hindsight, I would say just, just keep doing what you're doing, but aim a little bit higher. Um, I, I was, I was pretty modest and I was aiming ridiculously high compared to, I, I set very high standards for myself, but if I, if I could go back and give advice, I would say set even higher standards, e aim even higher, because what if you reach your, your goals? I actually, I set goals when I was 20, I reached them when I was, I was 37 and I thought, why, why did I set so low goals? <laughs> That's great advice. And second, what advice would you give to a new short-term rental investor who's getting started today? Great question. Um, if you're new to the space, I can only assume that you have some experience in, in the long-term space or at least in the real estate space. Uh, a lot of the lessons that you can learn from real estate in the long-term are very uh, applicable to the short-term space. For example, Location is a key factor in short-term rentals, just as long-term. But there are a lot of things, there's a lot of lessons learned that you need to undo um, if you're experienced in the real estate and in the long-term rental space. Um, one of the lessons you have to learn, I think the biggest mind, mindset there is that when you are renting long-term or when you're buying assets, you're basically monopolizing um, an asset and if you're renting it out, it's something that people want or they need it. They need a place to live in. But when you're doing short-term rental, it flips the table. They don't need your short-term rental at all. They can go anywhere they want. And it doesn't matter where you are. If you're on the south uh, point of Miami Beach, well, these people can go to Aruba. 
and they're gonna outplay you there. Uh, they nobody needs your services. You need to actually provide a service. You're not providing housing. You're not providing shelter. You're not providing essential service. You're providing a luxury service, and they don't need to buy from you one bit. There is no desperation there. You need to convince them to uh, to come and stay with you, and you need to you need to have that mindset because if you don't manage to switch it around, you're not going to get good reviews. Very great advice. And last question, what is your favorite book that's impacted your mindset? Uh, my, my favorite book is, uh, is the one that my wife told me eight years ago when I said I might be starting a company. She said, well, you should read this book. And I didn't. And then after many years of, of misery, because that's what it's like starting a business, it's actually quite painful, I, I decided to read it. And when I read it, I think after only five pages, I, I, I started crying because it was such a big relief for me. Uh, the book is called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. It's, it's um, written by uh, Ben Horowitz, who is a very successful VC. And uh, he talks about his own startup journey and how basically every decision you make in a fast growing startup, you're in between a rock and a hard place. And the mistake that so many people do is they make a decision and then they get hit by the consequences. And they, they think, well, what if I had just, why did I have to go and make the wrong decision? But they never have the hindsight to realize that, oh, but every other choice every other option that I had would have given me the same outcome. And, and that was just amazing for me to understand that it's not about making the right decision because many times all the decisions are bad, but it's about, can you learn from it? Can you adopt? Can you fall down, get back up and move on? And that's what I learned from that book. And it's uh, something that I can recommend for everyone, whether you're, you're starting a company or not. If you're even working, if you ever had a job, it's a good book to read because whoever started that company that you're working at, they've gone through exactly that. All right. I haven't heard of that one. I'm definitely going to put that on my list. Sounds like a great one. Yep. Well, Marcus, thank you so much for coming on. It has been a really fun interview. If our listeners want to find you, find HostAway, learn more about it, where can they do that? Uh, great. Uh, I always say that uh, you, you, everyone can reach out to me all the time. The easiest way is just open Google and type in Marcus Hostaway LinkedIn. If you reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, it might take up to three months for me to see your, your answer, but I can tell you every single customer that has reached out to me on LinkedIn, I have answered and I have uh, helped them. So I very much appreciate the feedback. And if you're, if you're starting a new company and want some advice, you can also reach out there. If you're interested in Hostaway, you're probably better off if you, if you go to hostaway.com and sign up there. All right. Thanks so much, Marcus. We'll catch you later. Thank you very much. See you soon.